Hello, and welcome to the Westmoreland's virtual programming. Although we are gathered virtually, we want to continue a practice we began when gathering in person of acknowledgments. The Westmoreland Museum of American Art is situated upon the traditional lands of the Adena, Hopewell, Monongahela, Delaware, Shawnee, and Seneca Cayuga peoples. We honor all of the indigenous nations and their land with great gratitude and acknowledge the genocide and continuous displacement of indigenous peoples. We also acknowledge the enslaved Africans whose labor built this country during the colonial era and beyond. We acknowledge the harm inflicted upon the indigenous communities and the people of color across the country, which guides and inspires our work as a museum. This evening's program features a conversation with Chief Curator Barbara Jones and photographer Richard Misrak surrounding the Border Canto Sonic Border Exhibition. Barbara sits down to discuss what led Richard to this impactful work and the work's continued relevancy, especially given the current events transpiring at the border. Richard is one of the most influential photographers of his generation well known for his ongoing project, Desert Cantos. His work is held by major institutions, including the Museum of Modern Art, Whitney Museum of American Art, Metropolitan Museum of Art, and the National Gallery of Art, Washington, DC. He is the recipient of four National Endowment for the Arts Fellowships, a Guggenheim Fellowship, and the Coulter Price for Lifetime Achievement in Photography. His books include Border Cantos, Sonic Border, 2016 with Guillermo Galindo, Violent Legacies, On the Beach, Destroy This Memory, Petrochemical American, Golden Gate, and The Mysterious Opacity of Other Beings. He is represented by Frankel Gallery, San Francisco, Mark Selwyn, Fine Art in Los Angeles, and Pace McGill, New York. Okay, let's bring our guests, shall we? Hello, everybody. Hi. Hi, Mona. Hi, everyone. All right, well, I'm gonna head backstage, let you have a uh, conversation and tell us all about this amazing work. All right, well, I am going to just introduce Richard and then I will let him um, tell you all about um, his Border Cantos project. But the exhibition Border Canto Sonic Border is a collaboration between Richard Misrock um, and Mexican American artist composer Guillermo Galindo. Richard sees the landscape, Guillermo hears it. Organized by Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art, the exhibition is on view at the Westmoreland through September 5th. So I'm really pleased to have Richard here tonight. Um, we've met virtually one other time, um, but this having a virtual presentation, I think is one of the good things that has come out of uh, this pandemic. We can bring people here from California, um, even though it is virtual. Richard um, is well known for his landscape photography and his ongoing project, Desert Cantos. He's been photographing the Southwest for nearly 50 years. And while the border has always lurked, as he says, in the background, it wasn't the focus of his landscape photography. In his series, Border Cantos, Richard focuses his lens on places and objects in ways that reveal the traces of human impact on the land, bringing social commentary into his compositions. Since 2009, he's photographed along the nearly 2,000 miles of the border and has captured its diverse landscapes and communities. In many cases, what appear to be arrestingly beautiful on the surface reveals on closer study a more complicated story. I'm sitting in the gallery and these photographs, large scale photographs, some of them um, 80 inches wide are incredibly beautiful um, and technically crafted. Since his Desert Canto series began in 1979, Richard has organized his project into sections or themes he calls cantos. This structure found in Border Cantos as well was inspired by an epic poem by the American poet Ezra Pound titled The Cantos. Eight cantos are included in the exhibition, and they are sectioned in as the wall, the effigies, target practice, cutting for sign, against the wall, agua, the artifacts, and the other side. There are text panels and extended labels with each of these uh, cantos, so when you come to see the exhibition, um, you can read more about those. In Spanish, the word cantos also means song, 
adding a poetic nod to Belinda's work as a sound artist. So please enjoy Richard's presentation. I know you'll have a lot of questions at the end and I will facilitate those um, and come back and talk to you then. Thank you, thank you. I think what I'll do is um, kind of give a brief slideshow uh, of, of the series and uh, kind of fill in some gaps and then we can take questions later. Um, uh, as we just uh, mentioned uh, that uh, one of the first cantos was actually the border wall. So. Um, I did a whole series from uh, the um, California coast to the Gulf of Mexico. And um, uh, what I did was I go along the wall. Let me, let me uh, say one to advance them so I can uh, reference them. But um, these, are, these are from the first canto called uh, The Wall. And this is uh, Arizona. Uh, next, please. This is um, in California. Next. This is also California. This is important. This is a different kind of wall. Um, this is what they call a Normandy wall. And um, it's actually a vehicle barrier. Some, some walls are built to keep people out from climbing over. Um, and this one, it would be easy to climb over, but in such a remote spot that it's just strictly to keep um, vehicles from coming over easily. Uh, this is in California. This is actually where the border wall goes into the ocean in California. Um, people can just swim around it. Uh, people have been known to jet ski around it. It's it's not very efficient wall, but uh, it's where this wall ends in California. Next. Uh, this is also in Arizona. Um, one of the things that I, I found really fascinating about the wall is that particularly one of the more modern iterations is it looks like Richard Serra uh, sculpture or uh, um, uh, a Cristo. Um, like a wall in the landscape, a, a curtain. Um, it's made out of um, co uh, steel, kind of a rusting steel, um, very much the same material that uh, Richard Serra used and has that kind of presence. So my, my guess is that the designers working on this project for the government uh, were looking at Richard Serra sculpture. So there's some irony in that. Uh, next. Um, this is actually in Texas and this is a cabbage um, crop. Um, what was interesting about the wall in the Texas area is that um, you have the Rio Grande River. So the wall has to be set, which the Rio Grande River is actually the border. So the wall has to be inset and it actually cuts through people's um, land. So on both sides of the wall, you're actually still in the United States. That's another great irony of some of the walls. Uh, next. This is Nogales. Uh, the wall in Nogales, uh, there's, there's walls that go through kind of remote landscapes. There's the wall that goes through cities. This is one where that goes through the town of Nogales in Arizona. What's interesting about this is it cuts, the wall cuts right through a community. Um, a lot of times families, friends live on the wrong side of the wall or are split up by the wall. Um, so that, that's been a kind of interesting uh, problem with, with a different kind of problem with the wall. Next, uh, different, uh, you can see this is a little bit different. Sometimes it's uh, uh, steel that the, the wall is made of. Sometimes it's uh, landing pads left over from the Vietnam War. And then here are some iron mesh. So you'll see different kinds of walls. Next. One of the great uh, ironies about the wall is that in theory, the idea is, I guess, is that you, you know, people um, couldn't get over it. But these two teenage girls uh, were able to climb it without a ladder in uh, 18 seconds. There's a video on on the internet. I didn't make this; somebody else made this, and I found it one day, so I took a still from it. But basically, they just climbed over it um, without a ladder, without any assistance. And so, one of the things that you learn when you travel up and down um, the border is that the wall is really not very effective, it's not very efficient, it's more of a political symbol, and that becomes apparent. Next. And similarly, uh, there was other places along the border where the wall just stops and people just walk around. Uh, at this spot, I collected a lot of backpacks and water bottles and tennis shoes. Pe people know it's here and they just hike over there and walk around. This is, uh, this is uh, pretty ineffective. Um, 
the wall right now, the border is about two, almost 2,000 miles, and the wall goes about 680 miles in sections. It's not, it's not continuous. So, um, and many very steep terrain areas, uh, remote areas are very hard to build a wall, and so that's part of the reason that those walls are not built. And one of the ironies here is that it took about three to twelve million dollars a mile to build the existing wall of you know three to twelve million dollars of taxpayer money. And it just doesn't, it's not that effective. It's not the right solution to whatever the, however you want to define the problem. Uh, next, again, uh, the last wall that ended, that was in California. This is in Texas, same thing, where um, you can just watch people walk around these open areas where the wall ends. Uh, this was actually in Arizona. This was wall under construction that uh, at the time had not been built. I don't know that it's ever been completed. Uh, so this is just the uh, a wall under construction. But this is, uh, I should also point out that this project with Guillermo, and I'll talk about how we met in a minute, but uh, the project with Guillermo uh, began around uh, 2011. I think we started working together 2012, and we completed it in 2015, and it became a book and a, a museum traveling show in 2016 before uh, Trump was uh, uh, elected to office. So um, all this work that you're seeing is, was, was kind of pre-Trump era. And at the time, it was, it was interesting because it, um, it, it really didn't have a bearing. Um, on, you know, the, this project didn't have uh, much influence on, on the larger world. It was, I guess it was kind of a quiet uh, project. But once uh, Trump was elected and he made issues about the border, um, you saw the interest in the wall take off, and it's 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 there's really been a lot of interest in this project since then. Uh, next, perfect example in Los Indios in Texas. Um, I found this section of border wall. Um, I thought, oh, well, this has got to be a, a wall under construction. You know, maybe it's a gate or something going to be completed, and so it just wasn't completed yet. The first time I photographed it was in 2013, and I decided to come back in 2015 to kind of make a second photograph of it. And when I came back, the only thing that had changed was that some grass had grown around the perimeter. But otherwise, that's the extent of the wall. Uh, cost a lot of money to build that, and it's clearly uh, ineffectual. Uh, what you're looking at here, this is interesting. So this is a different material that I mentioned. This is actually... Uh, these were earlier uh, versions of the wall. They were um, repurposed landing, helicopter landing pads from the Vietnam War that were recycled. They were brought back from the war and used to build uh, the wall in many places. And this is all that material. This is actually, um, I met this man, Dennis. Uh, I was looking for somebody. Um, I'd started collaborating with Guillermo Galindo in 2011. Um, I was, made a presentation at a pop-up magazine in San Francisco. Um, it was about a different project altogether, and I sat in the audience, and then another man named Guillermo Galindo and Daniel Alarcon, the writer, got up, and Guillermo made a seven-minute uh, performance. He had found a bunch of objects along the U.S.-Mexico border in Texas, and he took those objects and created a musical instrument. And I was astonished when I saw that because I had been photographing along the border, but I photographed these human effigies, which we'll see shortly, that were made from artifacts found on the border, put on agave stocks, which are typical to the, to the Mexico landscape, by somebody anonymous. I don't know who did it. I don't know why they did it. I don't know if it was protests um, or, or warnings for people not to come over. But the fact that I found this fabricated sculpture and I met Guillermo, who was making instruments out of sculpture, I started when I was photo, I invited him to my studio, invited him to my studio, uh, studio and showed him the effigies uh, that I had photographed. And we decided to collaborate. And from then on, every time I drive along the border, I would bring back things for Guillermo to build into instruments, water bottles, tennis shoes, backpacks, and a section of border wall, which leads us to this picture here. This is actually a section of the border wall that must have gotten battered or broken somehow. I found it. It's 160 pounds. I couldn't move it. I found this guy with a truck that was willing to help get it into his back of his truck, and we shipped it back to California where Guillermo turned it into an instrument. Uh, next, please. That 
same section of border wall that you saw Dennis putting in his truck. That's the same section that's hanging here. This is a sculpture that Guillermo made. He's actually hanging the, the section of border wall from a, a chain that the uh, Border Patrol used to drag um, tires to smooth out areas of sand. Uh, the lumber, it was used to build, was original lumber used in building the border wall. And I brought those all back from the border. And then Guillermo built this instrument that he played um, uh, plays with mallets and different uh, kinds of objects and evokes, he calls them sound devices as opposed to instruments. And they evoke really eerie, interesting, powerful sounds. That's Guillermo, my partner. And this was the effigy I was mentioning. Uh, these are, uh, that was another canto of, um, of you know, these, these artifacts, these uh, kind of scarecrows that I found on the border. And I don't know who made them, but it reminded me of Guillermo making instruments. Next. They, these are, by the way, I found on the California border uh, in a particular area in kind of a remote area. Next. Uh, this one had been knocked over after time from the weather. Next. So Guillermo surprised me one day. Uh, it was interesting because Guillermo and I did not know each other before we started this project. And it turns out that my studio is, is in Oakland is not very far from his house and his studio, actually. And so um, one day um, I had shown Guillermo those pictures of the effigies. And one day he surprised me and brought this sculpture uh, into my studio. Um, and it's based on the effigies. It's obviously looks like one of the effigies, but it's actually a sound device. And let's see if we can get to the next one. I think we get to play. So this is a close up. Can't quite hear the sound. Oops, here we go. So that's just a little example of what Guillermo would do. So he'd build this sound box into um, um, into that into that sculpture, and it uh, with a violin bow he would he would play the strings, or he would take a hammer and hit the the, the chest, which had a sound box in it, um, and create this amazing sounds. All right, next slide. Um, another canto uh, was uh, I found these targets. Um, they're used by the Border Patrol in, the, in Texas. And um, the first time I went there, I drove past it's on a remote area and a highway, and I saw three Border Patrol trucks uh, doing tar you know, shooting at these, is, at these um, targets. And I couldn't get in, it was sealed off. And so I, I was a little frustrated, so, but I went away, I went on to photograph something else, spent the afternoon on the way home, I got there, everybody was gone, and the gate that was had been locked was stuck open. It was going in and out over and over again, just wide enough to allow my car to get in. So I, I drove in, photographed the targets. Uh, next. I photo photographed them, you know, uh, set up for shooting. I found shot up ones on the ground. Next. Photographed them close up. Then I also found when I was walking to photograph the targets, I was crunching these things on the ground. And there was thousands, literally thousands and thousands of these shells. And when I walked them, they made such a sound. I said, oh, my God, Guillermo can, can do something with that. So I got a bunch of garbage bags and I piled in as many as I could. And I basically brought them back to California for Guillermo to see if Guillermo wanted to use them. Let's see. Ah, and then I have another, uh, it's called Ball Game, another canto, which is not 
um, it's not been published yet. But um, what I found along the border is that often I would find a stranded ball, soccer ball, golf ball, tennis ball, everything you can imagine uh, that got would go over the border. Obviously, kids playing on the other side, but nobody would return it. So they were just kind of stranded. And I brought those back. And so this soccer ball plus the shells, the shotgun shells and other kinds of uh, shell casings um, get, inspired Guillermo to make another instrument. This is his drawing for that. It's called a bullet shell pinata. So he decided to make a pinata in the shape of a soccer ball and attach the shells to it. And then he would perform that. And that was quite remarkable too. I'm not sure if I have a clip here of him performing that, but this is actually, you can see him doing it. And it's quite a great sound. All right, next, uh, this is, um, this is actually uh, cutting for sign. It's very interesting that the Border Patrol has uh, radar, they have um, ground sensors, they have video cameras everywhere. They have the most sophisticated equipment all along the border to sense if somebody's coming across. But one of the most effective devices they use, it's very crude actually, it's based on a Native American, traditional Native American um, tracking device for, like for animals where they, Behind their tr trucks, they drag a bunch of tires. Often it's four, sometimes it's one big one, sometimes it's another material, but they often drag tires and other objects behind the trucks to smooth out the sand so that if somebody leaves a footprint, they can see that somebody's crossed there and then they can also follow it. And they do this all along the border. They do it often two or three times a day and it's, Turned out it's one of the more effective ways for them to track and see if people are coming across the border and, and go after them. So it's, it's from a canto called Cutting for Sign. I found these tires everywhere. This is in California. This is in Arizona. This is a grid of them. So you can see uh, the, top, the top row is California. The second row is Arizona. The third row is New Mexico. And the fourth row is Texas. So the four states along the border, um, you can see that this this is a, a, a variations of the same thing. Uh, to me, this reminded me of a fluxus sculpture um, or fluxus sculptures, and um, you know, and yet it's got kind of this sinister use. Uh, this is actually a snapshot of an animal plus my tracks. This shows you how distinct you can see what's going on there. That's that's actually my footprint plus uh, an animal. Oh, and then you can see that the where the tires dragged, you can see how it's smoothed out the other. You have a little ridge between. Next, and here's another version of of just the of the tracks that were left by the tires. And what's interesting about that is it looks like a stave for a musician, right? So you can see that there's kind of five slots there, and um, Guillermo decided to turn that into a score and started creating scores based on, on what we did on the border. Next. Yeah, so this is a, a, a graphic score created by Guillermo. It's obviously inspired by that last picture um, of, these, of the tracks, and we saw that, that one, yeah. Anyway, you get the idea. So this is a graphic score. Then this is a different idea. Um, this is the, the, the idea, the, the drawing for the Zapatello that Guillermo had based on some of the things that we had found, he had found and I'd found. And um, he, he calls it the Zapatello, and it's based on Leonardo da Vinci's Martello, which was a hammering machine. And, but instead of what Leonardo da Vinci did, Guillermo took a boot that I found on the border, a tire from the, the, the tire drags that I brought back. So here, actually, there's a boot that I found. Um, there's a tire, I brought both those back and Guillermo made the next instrument, that. And that's a Zapatello based on Leonardo da Vinci's Martello. And what he does is there's a crank on the right and he sits there and cranks it and it actually creates a rhythmic uh, a pounding. It's quite powerful and beautiful. And it's using all materials found on the border. Another thing that was just so fascinating about the border, uh, another series, I mean, people, one of the things when you go up and down the border, 
is we all have preconceptions of the place from news and books and things that we 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 know about it. When you go there, it's never the reality of the border is unlike anything you can imagine. Every place is different. The border in, in California is different from the borders in border towns in Arizona or is different than the border towns in Texas and New Mexico. And so um, one of the things that photography can do, it kind of allows you to really kind of feel that difference. So this just happens to be the backyard of uh, somebody in Texas. Uh, you can see that they've taken a great care with their lawn and their flowers. And then you have the border is kind of the wall that goes right through the backyard. By the way, on the other side of that fence, that's still the United States because it's a while, it's miles until you can actually hit the, the, the river, the Rio Grande River, which is where the actual border is. Next. This is a border in Texas. And this is not, you know, this is a, I mean, sorry, this is a, in um, Arizona. Forgive me. Um, and you can see it's a different community. 95% of the border wall placement goes through poorer communities. Um, the wealthier communi communities fight back and don't don't accept it going through their, their backyard. So um, that's another discrepancy that's not often talked about and that's worth uh, researching and thinking about. Next. Here in Texas, this was the house under construction and the border wall went up and then the, the house was abandoned. Property, it doesn't, wasn't good for property values. Next. Similarly here, there's a bunch of acreage along the border. Uh, I think this was Texas. And uh, same thing, there's, there's a lot of land for sale, homes for sale, because people don't want to live with that wall in the backyard. Uh, interestingly enough, um, I did work a little bit on the Mexico side of the border. Um, and so here's a case where um, I photographed a number of people actually use recycled materials, uh, scrap stuff, and build their homes along the wall using the wall as like a fourth wall. And this is an example of that. If you look carefully, you can see the border wall from the Mexico side is actually part of this, this home. Next. Uh, in Texas, um, people that live by the wall, um, you know, you can, the, the politics that are on TV all the time, it's really hard to know what's going on. You get, there's a lot of different sentiments and uh, there are a lot of people that live in Texas along the border and they do not want um, more walls in their backyards. Next. Uh, this was interesting. This was a, uh, a shooting range, you know, to, uh, golf, golfing range. Uh, this was a young boy um, teeing off in this practice range. And this is in the United States, but it's on the other side of the wall. You have to go through the wall to get to this range. That's a kind of a public range for people to use. Next. Uh, this is in Texas, the Rio Grande River, and this is somebody crossing. Uh, what they were doing is they were bringing um, items, uh, handicrafts that they make, really beautiful little handicrafts, really unique and original. Um, he, they put them out and put a jar there and you can, you know, on the honesty system, you can put some money in the jar and take something. And then, you know, they come back later in the day, get the money, put a new thing out and go back. And they wade back and forth across the Rio Grande all the time. It's still going on, even with the border patrol, even with the walls built and all that. So um, the wall is still a very, very comp, uh, the border is still a very complex, complex place. Next. Uh, this was a um, surveillance blimp in Texas. I think there's two of those. So like I said earlier, there's radar, there's ground sensors, there's all kinds of technologies being used to monitor the border. And this is a pretty unusual one. There are some of the, the uh, surveillance cameras along the border. Uh, this one's in California. Next. Uh, this was interesting. Um, this was a saying that I didn't know what it was at the time, but it, it was definitely foreboding. Um, can we have the next slide? This is a detail of it, I believe. And uh, this was a thing, we must secure the existence of our race and a future for white children. And then next to it, there's actually a big swastika. Um, that's actually a very famous uh, uh, Nazi phrase. Um, I think it's taken from Hitler, in fact, from Mein Kampf. And um, 
but it's very it's a it's called the 14 and it's, it's 14 words and it's um but this was i found on the border and i don't know 2000 i don't remember 2013 2014 a long time ago so this kind of um um you know racism and anti-semitism was was found early uh next uh this is very sad this is uh in uh holt california i believe it is and this is a um uh, unidentified um, people bodies that were found. So this is a um, you know cemetery for for missing people. Next, this is kind of a key uh, image. Um, I found, I made this photograph in two thousand and four, long before I began the project. I didn't know what this was. I found a blue barrel plus this flag in the middle of a remote remote area of California. Excuse me. I thought it was for um, off-roaders. Um, it says agua on it. Uh, there's actually water bottles inside of like four gallons or six gallons of water containers inside it. I thought maybe it was for people, you know, off-roaders and or races or some sort of thing that's in the remote area. It was only many years later, after I began the border project, which I began in earnest in 2009, that I realized um, that these were put out by humanitarians. Uh, hoping to help people coming across the border that might be in trouble. And um, these agua stations or these water stations could be found, like 250 were laid out every spring and summer for the, for the hot season. Uh, every two weeks, uh, they're checked by volunteers uh, to see if the water's used. If they're used, then they go and replace it. If not, then it's fine. And so... Um, and then what I learned even later was, is along with, with this being done in California, is that in each state there was other organizations, perhaps inspired by this organization that had been doing it since, I think since around 2000, or maybe even earlier, um, in Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas, uh, other humanitarian organizations put out water in different ways too. So yes, so this is another water station. So I did a whole series of these wherever I found them. This is a big grid of them, uh, in all the, all the different states. Uh, in Arizona, they often do it differently. Um, um, this is, um, anyway, they put out five gallons just sitting out there, with, not with the larger protective barrel. Uh, this is a group called No More Deaths. The group in California is called water, actually called water stations. Uh, the group in, in Arizona is called No More Deaths. Uh, this was a young woman that helped me. Uh, uh, I went on a trip with her and to see where she did it. And I, you know, I carried water bottles. And whereas uh, the folks in California, they usually can drive to areas where they can get to and take their trucks and drop off the water. Uh, some of the places in Arizona are much more remote. They they actually look for where people actually die the most. And those can be in very remote spots. So they go and they put water out there. Sometimes they'll put beans and other food supplies if they can. Uh, but often it's just carrying a couple of gallons in your, your hands or in your backpack some food. Uh, so I went out with her and to see what it was. And it, it, it could be pretty grueling. It was pretty intense and it was great. Next. Oh, uh, sorry, go back one. Never mind. Just keep it where it is. One of the things that I did find is that sometimes the water bottles were slashed for quite often. Sometimes they were shot up. Um, it has been documented that the Border Patrol sometimes will will actually slash water bottles so they can't be used again. Um, other vigilantes, um, vigilante groups have also um, tried to discourage people from coming, so they'll shoot the the water uh, the water you know containers with holes and stuff. Next. Yeah, here's a gravesite to the right. You can see a, a container that was shot up and there was four bodies that were uh, uh, died here uh, because they ran, they, they ran out of water and they were buried there. Next. Um, another water station. Next. I'm going through a little quickly because I want you to be able to ask questions. Another score by Guillermo, what he did is, is um, at first I brought back 
the used up flags after a season, those flags, because of the sunlight and the wind, they get just faded and, and, and torn and stuff. And I brought them back in Guillermo made new scores on top of those actually use them. So they're very sculptural and graphic, very beautiful. Next. Another score by Guillermo, sometimes doing it on my, one of my photographs. Next. 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 And uh, one thing I should say about Guillermo, if, if, if you're not familiar with his work or what, what these kind of strange graphic scores are, um, Guillermo is very much uh, influenced by the the uh, composer John Cage, who was very experimental and and conceptual in his, in his ideas, and Guillermo's taken it to his own level, but um, uh, really challenges all the traditions of of of, uh, of music and notation and 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 composition. Next, uh, this backpack I found. Next. Clothing. So I would find all kinds of stuff. This was a tuna can, use of tuna can and pair of pants. Next. Find religious items. Often these are all found along the border. Sometimes I wonder why would these left here? Um, I did find out at some point that sometimes when they're caught on the border by the border patrol, the border patrol makes them just dump everything they've got, all their belongings. Um, and so maybe that's the explanation, but I honestly don't know. Very mysterious, very mysterious. Um, next, teddy bear, backpacks, food. Oh, th this was interesting. So this is, um, this yellow foam is actually what, um, it's a foam booty. It's actually what, what people that are coming over the border, whoops, is what people that are coming over the border, they tie to their feet, they strap to their feet so they don't, leave their footprints on the tracks that the um, that the Border Patrol left when they were cutting for sign. So this is their way. They use both foam and sometimes carpet that they wrap around their feet so they don't leave their, their footprint, which is function like a fingerprint allows them to be identified. Next. This was a Dr. Chivago in Spanish. Um, old, beautiful volume that I brought back and Guillermo turned it into an instrument. He turned all these things in the instruments, I should say. Next. This is a, what I call a super grid of all the things I found on the border um, from California to Texas. Most of these things I brought back and Guillermo would turn and think about them, conceptually turn them into some sort of sound devices with the idea that there's some sort of, I guess, I think it's, and I hope I'm correcting, got this correct, but there's like Aztec notion that every object has its own sound. And so Guillermo would do what he could to evoke that sound. And the idea is that each one of these objects has a history and he's kind of releasing it through its sound. It's a kind of a beautiful poetic idea. Next, two tennis shoes, probably four-year-old child uh, on, the on, the on the Texas border. Uh, I think it was in 2015. It was fields of just children stuff. There's a bunch of unaccompanied children, thousands of unaccompanied children, uh, and they were stranded here. And so um, I collected a lot of artifacts from Bibles that they, you know, their personal Bibles uh, written, you know, dedicated from their mothers to uh, shoes. No adults with them. Next. Yeah, these are all items found on the border that Guillermo coaxed into instruments. That's Guillermo playing a shoe with a, with a toothbrush that came from the border. That's a packet of gum and a broken comb. Next. Here's a little sound from those things.
next. Um, this is a homemade ladder used to climb over the over the wall. Um, it's basically tree branches with some rope. Uh, again, this kind of crude, simple homemade device to go over these three to twelve million dollar walls. Um, it's just uh, asymmetrical. Next. This is a bike that I found along the border. Um, uh, people throw their bikes over the border in, in the California area and ride down the hill because there's ground sensors that would pick up walking but didn't pick up bicycles. So they figured that out, throw them over, but the border patrol would find them and catch them and then run over them with their trucks to ruin them. So you can see there's a bent tire there, but I brought this back for Guillermo and Guillermo turned it into an instrument. And this is an instrument he made kind of spin-off of uh, Marcel Duchamp, but this is, uh, or I guess that is Marcel Duchamp, sorry. Next. And then Guillermo, Guillermo made that. So, um, and he, you sit, he sits on the bike seat and he plays it. So, and spins the, yeah, there we go. Next. Next, I'm gonna move through a little quickly so we have time for questions. I'm gonna give myself three more minutes. This is a children's Bible I found. Next. This is this sculpture was made from the pages of that children's Bible, plus, you know, the, the, the shapes of the mountain, plus nails found a stuff made on the border. Next. That's Guillermo playing it. It's quite a amazing percussion instrument. Next. Found pants on the border. Guillermo turned that into an instrument. Next. In fact, I think that the pants were ground up and made into the paper that this score was printed on. Next. Getting close to the end here. Um, this is Veronica looking through the border wall at um, uh, in California. I had a conversation with this woman I'd never met for a half hour. We had a great conversation. And if I ran into her today on the street, I would not know what she looked like. This is where this was considered a humanitarian site in California where families on both sides of the border could speak to each other. But they went to great lengths to create this grid so you couldn't pass things through. Next. This is from the other side. This is places in the border because of the slats. You can see people on the other side. So I did a series of those. Next. 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 Next, good, we're at the last one. So this um, uh, this was uh, on the California where the, where the wall goes in the water. And it was really interesting to me. It looked like a jail cell. Um, and on the other side of the, of the fence, people are on the beach building sandcastles, body surfing, barbecuing, having a blast, loud music, partying. On the US side, because it's restricted, nobody's allowed there. So it's naked, this beautiful beach. So ironically, and there's a this guy watching me, and ironically, it was like I was on the wrong side of the, I was in jail, they they weren't. So we we constructed this wall, but kind of pinned ourselves in. A um, couple of details from that. It's a detail of the man. Next, and then I think this is the last of sound piece from from Guillermo. Not sure if that was sent. Maybe not. Uh, let's let's move on uh, for questions. Thank you, everybody. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. That was fabulous. Um, you have um, really given us such a comprehensive view of of the border, and you know, so many of these photographs are 
we have not 18 of them in the exhibition, so you really spoke to almost every one that, that we see here. But the last one that you included um, is actually 120 inches or 10 feet wide. So it, it really does, um, I think, you know, the, the, the large scale of these, they really um, uh, allow you to immerse yourself in them and, you know, really encompass your peripheral vision when you're, when you're close to them in there. They're framed beautifully. The glass doesn't reflect us, um, the, which is really a nice feature. So in speaking about that, I just want to ask you about the process a little bit, you know, like what type of camera do you use and how are you able to achieve the detail that you achieve in this such large scale? Because these are, I mean, you can see in the photograph that you showed of the wall in Nogales, you can see a dog up on the hillside, a baby in a carriage. So uh, can you speak a little bit to that? Yeah, so it's interesting because it, it, behind you, on the wall behind you, which is the earliest photograph I made from the series, that was made in 2004. Mm -hmm. And I was still shooting with an 8x10 view camera. It's an old-fashioned kind of camera where you pull the hood over your head. It's got a bellows on it. Um, you got to focus. It's you know, kind of a real cumbersome thing. And that's the way I worked for many years. That was the last one. When I started photographing the project in earnest again in 2009, I had stopped using that camera and gone to a medium format, a Hasselblad mm -hmm. um, camera with a digital back. Mm -hmm. And the digital backs, the quality has gotten so much better in recent years that it allowed me to do comparable quality to my earlier 8x10. In fact, it's, it's now uh, superseded that. Yeah, they're they're really impressive. So I hope people will come in and see them. So um, one of the questions that um, one of our staff members had when you spoke to our staff meeting was how you were received at the border. Oh, interesting. Yes. Um, so uh, as an old white guy traveling on the border, <laughs> um, you have a different response than many than if I was younger, if I was um, Mexican descent. Um, when I went with Guillermo, Guillermo and I went one weekend and we, uh, you know, together and we had a different response than when I went by myself, which was really interesting. That was eye opening. But uh, mostly what I would do is, is I'd go along the border and um, often Border Patrol would come rushing up. I would set off a sensor and I'd be out there photographing. They set off a sensor and they'd come and they'd check me out. Sometimes they were really nice and polite. Great. And once in a while they were hostile. Sometimes they would tell me that, um, you know, my camera was gonna get stolen and I better get out of there, you know? Um, another time there was activity on the border, uh, not far from me, somebody, some activity of some arrest or drug pass, something was going on. So I was, they thought I was part of it. So they pulled over and they had guns drawn and all that stuff. And, you know, that I, you know, they were surprised to just find me. Um, and then other times, like I'd be photographing, there was one time um, where I was in a remote spot and this Border Patrol agent, she came climbing from, I could see her from a really long way. I thought she, I was gonna get in trouble. I thought maybe I was in the wrong area or something. She climbed up the hill. She had a big gun strapped over her and she came up and said, I'm gonna keep an eye on you because there's some uh, cartel activity near nearby and you know we just don't want you to get hurt. So she sat with me for a half oh. hour I photographed um, sometimes people, sometimes Border Patrol agents would show me um, their cell phone pictures, you know, show them off or tell me where a good place to go photograph. So you got everything from mm -hmm. hostility to sweetness, um, just like anywhere else. It's just a range of human behavior. So I'm looking to see if we have any questions in the chat. I'm not seeing, seeing any um, at this moment, but um, surprising. Um, so talking, oh, here we go. I do have a question um, from Sally Knuckles. She says, do you have plans to continue photographing the border wall and what other projects are you considering? That's a good question. Yeah, so um, it was so interesting because I worked with, you know, Guillermo and I worked very hard on this project for several years and then we finished it. And then once, once it got a lot of attention, you know, a lot of media attention has gotten a lot. Um, 
I felt like we our job was already done because so many people are paying attention to it. Other photographers are out there now. So it's really, it would be redundant at this point. I feel, feel like at least I, I feel done. Um, I've actually been working on a remarkable project uh, starting just from just before the pandemic. Um, I'm doing all the art for a new um, psychiatric hospital in San Francisco. Uh, it's a five-story building. Uh, it's a UCSF uh, clinic. It's the Mary Friend Pritzker Hospital. And it's been really challenging, especially with COVID and everything. But um, uh, I've been, you know, that hospital is trying to destigmatize um, you know, issues with mental health. And they're doing the most innovative psychiatric research and uh, treatment. And they wanted to, they build a new building. The building's under construction will be done in October. Um, they wanted to use art, not the normal, I guess, wallpaper, whatever they use uh, normally, you know, kind of thing. They wanted to kind of be more adventurous, I guess is the way I'd put it. And so uh, we've been working on that and it's been, uh, very rewarding and, and powerful. It feels really important to be doing that. And we have a question from actually my assistant, Bonnie West. Um, how did you decide where to go to take your pictures? Uh, so one of the things I do is um, I just wander. I would just methodically, you know, fly close to the border, rent a car, and then I mean, sometimes I would, in California, I could just do it with my own car. But but if I was going to go to Texas, I might fly, get closer, and then rent a car, and then just wander up and down the border. And I just tried to make sure that I covered pretty much all of the border over time. So I would just do a trip for 10 days or two weeks, uh, one spot, just drive around. I never, it was never calculated because I never knew what I was going to get. And I was always surprised. It was always remarkable. Mm -hmm what I would discover at these different places. Yeah, that I'm, I'm sure that I've never been um, to really near the border. I've been to California, but not close to the border. Um, I did want to say that um, Exterminating Angel was purchased by the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. And so that has a, a good home now. And it is here in, in our gallery um, for the duration of the exhibition. It came in a little bit later uh, because it was in an exhibition um, in Stanford. And so it's here with a video that shows Guillermo playing it. And we also have Zapatello as well. So both of those came in and um, that big piece of wall came in a crate that weighed 600 pounds. So <laughs> it, was, it was pretty incredible. Why, I, you know, we had four art handlers and I think two other people trying to manage those crates that came from California. So, um. well, if I could just add to that, too, one of the challenges of this project was is I'd be on the border and I'd find things like that. I've never done that before. I didn't know how to get them back, you know, yeah. whether it was lumber or that big piece of steel or things. So uh, I just, you know. We winged it, you know, and just figured it out. And somehow it happened. Sometimes I'd be texting Guillermo and say, do you want this, that? He said, no, not that, but get that, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> and then it's like, how do you do that? You know, I didn't know. So it, it was kind of it was kind of a wild, uh, I guess that's one of the things I would say about my, my collaboration with Guillermo. You know, the wall is such a symbol of division. And we really bridged that, you know, our, mm -hmm. our working together kind of conceptually bridged the whole piece itself and, and our cultures, you know, and all that, and also our mediums, you know, uh, mm -hmm. two very different mediums, we brought them together. And I think they both benefited from that, that collaboration. Oh, I think so, definitely. And, and you can, and you feel that when you're in the exhibition. And I think the, the awareness, I think that this, this exhibition is bringing to, to people that, that aren't necessarily familiar with, with the issues. Of course, we hear it on the news, but as you said, it's, not the same story, it's different stories. And these photographs really tell those stories. Um, Guillermo was here to um, do, do the sound check and to you know, facilitate the setup of, of his instruments. So there's eight of those here and um, we had a program with him you know, playing. And so that is really, it, it's really wonderful to hear in the exhibition where your photographs are, um, you hear the sound off you know, to the to the other side. So it's almost a sort of hauntingly, um, you know, um, 
really hauntingly beautiful sound that sort of comes through the gallery adjacent to this one, then and it flows into this gallery. So, so well, can I, I, I speak to that? I think this is something mm -hmm. um, of all the pieces in our project together, and there's a lot that I really love. The piece that's in your gallery, the eight um, different pieces that play together. It's based yeah. on the Aztec calendar. Or, it, um, is. it it changes over the hours. It's never the same. It's it, right. it's sometimes it's beautiful and lyrical. Sometimes it's intense. That's my favorite piece in the whole project. And I just I whenever I'm around it, I need to sit for like a half hour. And you never hear the same thing twice. No. It's really it's kind of a remarkable remarkable piece. It is. It's 260 minutes, and it plays in a loop. And there, all of the um, instruments are synchronized. And so sometimes it's very, very soft. You can barely hear it. And then other times, when the when there's the crescendo, it's it's loud and it's a little startling because you can be in here and not, you know, in other places in the museum, and you don't hear anything. And all of a sudden, you start to hear, you know, bits of it. So, um, right. but I, I love that, you know, and this is in, in you know, the book that a, about you seeing the landscape and that the Guillermo hearing it. And when you talked about the walls, um, you know, and all those different materials, they all make sound and in the heat and in the cold and, you know, they creak and they make all different um, noises. So, you know, I think you captured that in the photograph that he did with this sound um, sculptures. So we have another question here um, from Michael Hyatt. He said, there are musicians and artists here in Tucson who have been addressing the humanitarian crisis for many years. Are you trying to show this work in Arizona? Oh, that's really interesting. Um, I would have loved to have shown the work in Arizona. When we first traveled the show, uh, I think the Scottsdale Museum of Art had expressed interest, and then they changed their mind. So. Um, uh, Yes, I think it would be great. And there's some, you know, there's other uh, artists and photographers in Arizona that have, you know, addressed it because it's right in their backyard too. But I would love to to do that show. So uh, if he wants to do host the show, thank you very much. We'll, we'll, we'll let's great. talk. <laughs> and then, you know, Crystal Bridges is traveling it, Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art. So really contacting them um, it, because it will continue to travel. It's, it, it's very, um, um, Sort of condensed in many many heavy crates but it, it does travel easily actually if i could if i can do that that this is so crystal bridges museum had the original monster show it was just a huge show mm -hmm. they bought a number of pieces for the permanent collection and then they've been traveling that and the show that you have is there it's a smaller uh, uh selection of works but it's really really strong that's a great idea. They, they've been traveling it for several years now, and if there's some an Arizona museum that, uh, you know, uh, university gallery or something like that, that would like to yeah. take, it would be fantastic. Yeah, and it is a it. We actually enlarged the exhibition for the Westmoreland because it was actually too small right. for our galleries, but we borrowed from you eight additional photographs, the two sculptures that I talked about, um, exterminating angel and Zapatello, but. Um, and then Guillermo's flags. We also have some of Guillermo's flags. So that's possible if someone wanted it and wanted to enlarge it because Crystal Bridges is very amenable to, you know, you adding to it if you feel like it. So good idea. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. All right. Well, I think um, we're, we're at the end of our program here. And I thank you very much, Richard. Oh, thank you. It's a really a pleasure. And I'm so thrilled you have the show. I'm just, yeah, yeah totally. thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you both. I really enjoyed it. I hope everybody else did. Thank you, Mona. Thanks, everyone, for watching. All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining us this evening. Thanks to our members and our museum staff, as well as Art Bridges, for supporting this program. Uh, gracious thank you for you all for joining us on this nice, hot, also rainy evening. Um, if you would like to continue joining us for more future programs, please go to thewestmoreland.org for upcoming programming and to reserve your ticket to see the exhibition. Thank you, everyone, and good night.